So Sunday afternoon, I got a text from Pastor, and he said, Hey, Doug, just to put you on notice, would you be able to be on standby? Um, the passage is Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. And uh, I didn't look at the passage. Dummy me. And I just respond, sure, I can be ready. So Sunday night, I'm in bed and I'm not sleeping. I'm thinking through, okay, this is what the passage is. All right. So Monday morning, I, I arose and it was also the day of a funeral for a uh, gentleman that I have known for the last 50 plus years. And he and his family had been instrumental. So I'm still under that influence. I, I said, Pastor Paul, why don't you let myself and uh, Dr. Nelson and Shad take care of Sunday and uh, you just rest up? Well, during the funeral, I uh, noted that my phone was vibrating. I looked at it afterwards and this was the message I've got. Doug, I think I'm going to take you up on your offer. I didn't respond. I just, I'll be there for you. Well, then I started thinking about what the passage was. Christian warfare. So Tuesday, my, one of my daughters and I were coming back from an appointment, and I was not the cause of the road rage, nor was I the road rage. All of a sudden, this one car in front of us, as we're leaving Oshkosh, tried to go into the lane that was ending to try to get around a grain truck, and I'm just Colorado license plate, or Connecticut license plate, excuse me. Didn't mean to throw Colorado under the bus. And I'm thinking to myself, this person doesn't understand Wisconsin in the fall. Grain trucks and farm implement tractors are all over the place. Learn to drive 55. And as we got going down the road, I, I looked at my speedometer. I'm thinking to myself, hey, this truck is really giving us grace because he was doing 60. Well, the, the car from Connecticut never met an obstacle it didn't like. And he's just all oh, just trying to pick that point. And he finally found it, he thought. I don't know what he was thinking because as he's going past it, I just know there was an SUV coming our way only because that SUV now was over in the ground. Uh, we praise God. Uh, he was able to get it slowed down, didn't do any swerving either into the culvert or into the eastbound lane. Then uh, I think it was Wednesday evening, I got a text message from uh, a family friend and it said, pray for us like we've never needed prayer before. I'm thinking, all right, Lord, I volunteered for this. And um, several other things have occurred. And I got to thinking this morning, by the way, I reworked the introduction this morning because as I got to thinking about all the events of this week, I got to thinking this morning that Christian warfare is not new. All right? Anyone who has walked with God has had it happen. It should not be unexpected. It should not shock us or surprise us. One of the oldest books in the Bible, the book of Job. By the way, Job, even though it's placed way up by the Psalms, Job was actually a contemporary of Abraham. So when you're reading through the Bible, it's better to put the book of Job right there alongside Genesis chapter 11 and 12, where we're talking about Abraham. But I think about this, that God allowed within limits for Satan to attack Job. 
And my first thought is, wow. But then I think back in my life. And if you were to think in your own life, you wouldn't realize that God has allowed attacks to come. Then Joseph, in the book of Genesis, was allowed, God allowed his brothers to sell him off and all that occurred. But when we get to the end of the book of Genesis, Joseph, after all he's been through, said this all happened because God. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know that if I was Joseph, that I'd be able to look my brothers in the eye and say, but God meant it for good. Then you come to the Apostle Paul. God allowed physical affliction that God's grace may be seen. And many of us in this room can talk about physical affliction. Some of you have gone through cancer. Some of you other afflictions. And then we can look at the 10 of the 11 apostles met death by martyrdom that the gospel may spread. When the last night our Lord was with his disciples, he spoke to them in the Gospel of John in chapter 15 in verses 18 through 21. And he said to them these words, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. Friends, when the attacks come, they're not coming because of you. They're becoming because of the message that you desire to share with the lost. And Satan does not want that to occur. But God, our short review in the Gospel of, or the Epistle of Ephesians, but God has chosen us to be his children. Ephesians chapter 1, 4 and 5. And we're all like, whoa, that is exciting. God chose me. And then in chapter one, 4, verses 1 through chapter 5 and verse 16, God's called us to be his servants. And we're like, okay, that's, that's good. But then in chapter 5 and verses 17 through chapter 6 and verse 9, God commands us to be submissive in several different areas of our life with one another, with our spouse, with our children, and children vice versa, by the way, and with the employee-employer responsibilities. And we're like, all right, I got this. But then we come to this morning's passage in Ephesians chapter 6. And I want you to note with me verses 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. This morning, I want us to see that that which we uh, look at is simply this, that we are in a battle. And we cannot be on the sidelines. Rather, we are called to be on the front lines of the battle. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, we just stop and we thank you. We praise you for who you are. And Father, for those here this morning who know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, we thank you that you have chosen them and you have placed them, Father, in the body of Christ. Father, by the time we're done this morning, we pray that we would also praise you for how you work in our lives and you allow us to be a part of the battle that is ongoing today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice with me point number one. We are commanded to be strong in the Lord. Notice with me the Apostle Paul here says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. After all that the Apostle Paul has said in the book of Ephesians, he ends with this. <clears throat> Don't be strong in your own might. Don't be strong in who you are in Christ. Be strong in the Lord. The idea is to be made strong. Increase in strength. The Amplified Bible puts it this way. Be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with Him. And part of that union with Christ is this. Our catechism question today. The Holy Spirit. By the way, God makes no mistakes. Pastor Paul has laid out the catechism questions. And here we are today. We talked about the Holy Spirit in our catechism question. And here we are realizing that part of being strengthened is allowing the Spirit of God to work in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 1, in Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul prayed on no less than three occasions in those three chapters that the believers at Ephesus, and yea, also us today, would be strengthened by the Holy Spirit of God. Let me ask you this morning, what are you allowing, allowing to strengthen you today? I hope it's not the nightly news. There is no strengthening power in that. Although it is a reminder of the battle or a portion of the battle. I hope it's not in a political figurehead because that's not going to get you anywhere because they come and go. We've had president after president after president. We've had speakers of the House. We've had uh, presidents of the Senate year after year after year. Let me ask you this morning again, who is strengthening you? Is it God? Is it the Spirit of God? If it is, notice with me still in verse 10 and point number two, we are commanded to be strong in the power of his might. <clears throat> Listen, folks, you can go work out at the gym all you want. All right. Although I do follow the philosophy of Paul to Timothy, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, physical activity uh, is of little value it still has some value all right those of you who have heart issues or diabetes 
know that physical activity is important, but it's not the end all. This morning, as believers in Christ, I want you to understand that our power comes from Him. And by the way, again, in Ephesians chapter 1, in Ephesians chapter 2, in Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul laid out how the power, the dunamis of God is what strengthens us. How powerful is his strength and his ability? It's in your notes. So we're going to go fast this morning. If you can get there before I'm done, blessings on you. But in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, it talks about this power raised Christ from the dead. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the kind of power I want in my life. The kind of power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead so that he is no longer in the grave. But not only is he risen from the dead, he has ascended to the right hand of the Father. Friends, do you understand the power that's available to you if you will walk with him? And then Ephesians uh, chapter Actually, it starts at verse 19 in the second part. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Wow! That's exciting stuff. God is our Power is our strength, not us. And it gets gooder. Ephesians 2, 5. He has raised us from spiritual death. Listen, folks, spiritually speaking, you were dead as a doornail before God. Or shall we go with but God? chose you and brought somebody into your life to show you the scripture at the appointed time and instilled into you the faith to believe and then to allow you to walk with him in the battle before us. And then Colossians 1.13 for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. I could preach another message right there on that verse. But let me ask you a question this morning. If you are a child of God, are you still living in the domain of darkness? In thought, word, or deed? If so, get out! You don't belong there. Why? Because in his power, as a child of God, he has transferred you out of that into spiritual light. And then his strength. And I don't have time. Even though, by the way, Michael gave, us, gave me 15 extra minutes this week. All right? All right? If you were here last week, you understand he was done, and it's like... By the way, it's part of the reason I agreed to preach today because I knew I had 15 extra minutes in these batteries. All right. But in his strength, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 12 and 13, it is his strength is the reason the Apostle Paul could pin these words to the Philippians as he was in the Philippian jail or in the jail at Rome, excuse me. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled 
and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Why? Because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. No matter what God puts us in, no matter what God allows to come into our life, no matter our walk of life, in Christ, we can do all things. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, You therefore, speaking to Timothy, My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And don't we need that same encouragement today? My child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then only through him can we accomplish the task he has given us. And throughout Ephesians, we see Paul praying that his readers would be strengthened. Why? Because Paul knew it was necessary. Paul knew what was going to happen. This is the Apostle Paul who penned the words of Philippians 4, 12 and 13. This is the Apostle Paul who penned the words in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, talking about how he pleaded with God to take away the thorn in the flesh, whatever that may have been. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. And that Apostle Paul was challenging the Ephesian believers. And by the way, the book of Ephesians is a cyclical letter, meaning that all the churches in the Asia Minor region were probably recipients of a copy. So they too read this. And by the grace of God, we get to read it today. And then notice with me thirdly, we are commanded to put on the whole armor of God. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God. Now I want you to note something about the word here, put on, or phrase, excuse me. It has the idea of permanence. In other words, when we put the armor on, because the battle is a 24-7 battle, God doesn't want us taking it off. And the idea behind the word put on is get it on and let it stay there. Folks, the Christian life is not something that's played on Sunday and then we take off the armor and spend the rest of the week undressed. No. We put it on and we keep it on. And I know many times I have even said, you know, pray the armor on in the morning. Well, you better be praying about it all day long. And when you sit down in front of the TV, you better be praying the armor on. Because your mind can go places it ought not to go. And then you ought to be praying the armor on before you go to bed. Why? Why? Because the older I get, the more I realize Satan is a lot active. Bad English, but you get the idea. He's very active in the night hours. And the older I get, and the more I have to get up in the middle of the night, I only have to do one thing. Come back, lay down in bed. And the mind is racing thinking about different things, things that I'm not going to be able to change during those hours. And probably most of the things I'm thinking about, I'm not going to be able to have an effect on anyways. But see, Satan doesn't care. He's there to disturb you and get your mind off God. Then I want you to think with me because we need the whole armor of God and keep it on permanently is because Satan's schemes are built around stealth and deception. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 13 through 14, we read these words. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, 
disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. By the way, you need the armor of God on even when you're listening to a quote-unquote preacher on TV. I'm going to say it. Most TV preachers aren't worth listening to. All right? First and foremost, be grounded in your local church. Be grounded in the pulpit ministry of your local church. Get into a small group. By the way, there's one on Sunday night. Talk to myself or Jeff after the morning service if you want to be involved in that one. On Monday night, that's Pastor Paul's. On Thursday night, I think I've got this right. Where is Dr. Paul? Thursday night, right? And Wednesday afternoon. And Wednesday afternoon. I, he gives you two options. That's what you can do when you're retired. But there are options in the local church to get grounded in the word. My mom, who I know is not going to be listening or watching this, she's got some good guys she listens to. And other guys that, you know, if we had direct TV, I could do, do this. I could delete that channel from her program guide. Because there are some that I'm like, oh, oh please, no, not him. No. So we, we try to guide her. But I can't sit there with the control in my hand all Sunday morning. So we need the armor on. We need to be able, by the way, we need to know what the Word of God says so that we can withstand. Because verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 11 says, No wonder, for even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. Some of these guys can look good. I mean, they can flash a smile on TV. Get the slick back hair. God loves you. Send me some money and he'll love you even more. Or build a glass cathedral. If you're old enough, you'll get that one. Verse 15. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Friends, listen to me. We have got to know what the Word of God says. And one of the things it says to us is, we must be on guard. We must have the armor of, of God on us and utilize it because Satan is constantly acting like an angel of light. And that is a scary thought. Think with me, there's an increasing belief in the existence of the devil, just not the Bible-defined devil. We are, what, seven weeks, almost two months, uh, away from a holiday that I hate. Uh, God was gracious and allowed one of our kids to be on, born on October 30th, so we were always able to have a birthday party instead of having to do the trick-or-treating thing. But by the way, look at your stores in the next couple of weeks, if it isn't already there. The satanic nature of the holiday. Run from it. That's all I'm going to say. But also think of the shows, the movies, the video games. My late sister was heavily involved in the paranormal and satanic shows. I'd walk into her apartment and, oh my, I would grab her remote, all right? Either A, I would turn it off so she would listen to me, you know, at least hear me, um, or hit the mute and then sit between her and that. The only problem was then she would pick up 
one of her electronic gadgets and, and start playing with that. But Satan is always working. 1 Peter 5.8 reminds us that we must, ne must ever be vigilant, begin. The reason is because Satan is what? Always active. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, be of, so be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Listen, folks. The Christian life is not just sitting back and relaxing. Matter of fact, as you read the scripture, resist, put on, be vigilant. Why? Because Satan, until the day that he is cast into the lake of fire himself, isn't giving And if you are a child of God, he knows he's already lost you to God, but he can make your life miserable if you don't keep your eyes on God. Roman numeral number four. The rationale for putting on and not taking off the armor of God is found in uh, verses 11 through 13 of our passage in Ephesians. Why? So that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. It's interesting that the, this phrase, stand firm or stand against, it's a military term. And why wouldn't it be? Because as Paul goes through this passage, he is literally talking about a Roman soldier and all of the Roman soldier's garb that he would wear and makes a spiritual application of each of those pieces. But to stand firm here, it's a military term, and it means to hold a critical position while under attack. I want you to stop and think with me. Where you are seated, where you stand, wherever God has placed you, is a critical position in the cause of Christ. He has put you next to the neighbors you are because he considers you a critical piece of the battle for their soul. He's put you in the workplace where he has because he considers you a critical piece in the battle for your co-worker's soul. He has given you the children he has given you because he considers you a critical piece in the battle for their soul. And by the way, the battle for your children's soul doesn't end the day they turn 18. All right? You can cut the umbilical cord at 18 and say you're on your own. But many life experiences tell you you are constantly involved in their life. Make it a part as a Christian mother or father so that they have something to look back to, an anchor, somebody that's got the armor of God on who they can look to and, and get a proper response to their issue because God considers you critical in their spiritual growth. And I'm just going to do this quickly. Think of just a few things that Satan attacks. In Genesis 3 in the garden, he questioned and twisted God's word. And we have to be prepared, don't we? How many times have you heard somebody come to you with a twisted uh, interpretation of a passage of scripture and you're like, Hey, it's our responsibility to be grounded in the Word of God. Notice with me also in, in Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus misusing Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 2, 18, hindering God's servants. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul to the Thessalonians said, For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet 
Satan hindered us. Why do we need the armor on constantly as impermanently? Because Satan wants to hinder the work of God. In a passage we already looked at in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, because he appears as an angel of light. But then notice with me also here the need for permanence is because the battle is spiritual, not physical. <clears throat> Although, if you use an inhaler for your asthma, it can sometimes be physical because that new inhaler that you use can cause your voice to start going. But it's still spiritual. See, I could have started a new inhaler last Sunday. And it wouldn't have bothered me. Here I am today. But it's a spiritual, not physical battle. Perhaps the hardest part of the battle being described for us is this. We cannot see it with our physical eyes. We are not always able, as Job did, to see the lobs come in and truly affect our lives. Job 1 and 2, all of his kids wiped out. All of his farmland all of his animals, gone. Then you get to chapter 2, and not only does he lose his physical strength as he's filled with boils, but his wife also says, curse God and die. I mean, the guy lost everything. Now, many of us have never been in that position. But that doesn't mean our spiritual battles are any less. You see, at the church at Ephesus, we've talked about this before, in just approximately 30 years, this church would go from being a thriving, growing, exciting church to a church that Jesus Christ described himself as a church that had left their first love. Somewhere along the line, the words that the Apostle Paul had imparted to them in the work of the Holy Spirit, somehow, some way, they began to drift from it. And they lost their first love. In some way, shape, or form, they began in their own personal lives and perhaps the life of the church. They began accommodating worldly practices and habits. Because there in Ephesus would have been the, the pagan temple. The, since it was part of the Roman Empire and, and uh, fairly close to the coastline, it was more or less a port city. So the influence was constantly flooding upon shore. Is it any wonder Paul said, keep on the armor of God? By the way, I might add, it's why it's important to apply all the commands and principles that Paul has laid out for us in Ephesians. Putting, or starting with, put off concerning your form of conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt, but put on the new man, in Ephesians chapter 4, 22 through 24. And then we're going to blaze through. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's Satan and his demonic host that we are battling. And in fact, let me, let me step back and say, it is not even us that is battling. It is us in the power of the Spirit of God that are doing the battle. Hence, we need to put on the armor of God. Hence, we need to hide God's word in our hearts, Psalm 119 and verse 11. Hence, the need to apply all that Paul has taught in the book of Ephesians. It's against rulers. They get stressing uh, their authority. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15 uh, says, When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. But the demonic host is at work. There is that stress from God against powers. Stressing their strength. Listen, folks, I know sometimes people, uh, I think, glibly talk about um, 
Oh, I'm going off to fight the spiritual battles. Man, if you go off that way, you're in trouble. Just because we cannot see the spiritual battle does not make it any harder. There is a spiritual battle out before us. And it's against rulers, it's against powers, it's against the rulers of the darkness of this age. And it points to their wide influence in the world. A couple of passages, one out of the book of Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. The, the angel of God coming and talking to Daniel and explains why he was delayed in coming to Daniel to explain the dream. But he said, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief priests came to help me for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Michael explains to Daniel a spiritual bat battle that Daniel was totally unaware of. Daniel could see the kings of Persia, but Daniel could not see the angelic battle. I've often said if God could open our eyes to see the spiritual battle that is going on above us, even as we speak this morning, we would run out of here in fear. Because Satan is going to try to use anything at his disposal, including the demonic host, to try to influence our thinking. Makes it too hot in church, makes it too cold in church. Maybe we stayed up too late on Friday and Saturday night. Therefore, we're too tired in church. Or maybe we're not feeling well enough. And we're just like, oh, we need to be careful. And the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, possibly talking about demonic hosts that are involved in the most wretched and vile uh, immorality. But also, I believe it's talking about how uh, the widespreadness of the demonic host. Then we come to verse 13, point number five. And it's the plea. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can withstand in the evil day. Let me suggest to you that today is a part of the evil day. How do we know that? Because the millennial reign of Christ is somewhere out there. I don't know what your end times theology is. I know what mine is, so I'll be careful as I walk this road. <clears throat> somewhere out there is the millennial reign of Christ. But even at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, the book of Revelation lets us know that there's going to be one more final battle. Even after a thousand year reign of Christ on earth, Christ ruling with a rod of iron, there's still going to be human beings who reject God. But it's all in God's plan. But then the great white throne judgment and all those without Christ all those who have rejected Christ are once and for all thrown into the lake of fire and then eternity. Then no more tears, no more sin, no more heartache. What a time of rejoicing. What a time of not just simply standing around the throne of God, but also doing the task of heaven. Not going to be lazy boys in heaven. Hope you got your work gloves. Because we're going to be tending to the garden of God. Just as he intended for Adam and Eve once and for all in eternity. And let me suggest this. It's not simply what you have done. But are you prepared to finish the race? Are you, you're not done. I don't care how old you are. You can be older than I am this morning. And a couple of you are. 
You're not done. It's not over. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. Paul feared failure and disqualification. Let me ask you a question. Do you fear failure and disqualification? The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. What's he saying? After I'm done preaching to you, I now have to go home and apply the message to me. Man. Are we like that? Do we fear failure? Spiritual failure? Do we fear disqualification? Or do we just play church on Sunday? Let's be reminded of something. When Sunday morning we come to worship God, not to feel good. We come to hear the word of God that God has laid on the heart of the preacher of the morning. But from that point till the next Sunday morning, we are in a spiritual battle and we need the words of God. And then little b there is, it's a constant battle. James writing said in James 4, 7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In a passage that we've already looked at, but I want to look at it again. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Verse 10, after you have suffered for a little while. Those are words of encouragement. After you have suffered for a little while. Somebody says, I'm 80 years old. Or 100 and... We're not even keeping count anymore, are we? 102. What do you mean a short time? This has been a long walk with God. Praise God. Right? Maybe you're just, maybe you're on the other end. You're just starting out. I gotta walk with God till I'm 102. However many days God gives you, walk with Him. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Woo! Right? Some of you were starting to drift on me. I saw you, Pam. Pam. I, 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 I saw you. But I want you to think with me. You're in a battle. You don't know how long it's going to last. Ask Mel. Ask the Tetzlaffs. You could have asked my late father who spent 29 years in the army. It's one battle after another it's being constantly prepared to fight that battle this morning i ask you will you take the charge that paul puts before us stand firm with the full armor employed get it on keep it on stay in the word Stay in the strength of His might and allow the Spirit of God to direct your paths no matter where those steps may lead. Father, we come before you this morning and we are thankful for your word. Lord, sometimes as this morning, 
it scares our sandals off. But then, Father, we're reminded that you're constantly reminding us to stand firm in your strength, in the power of your spirit. And we see from the saints of old and the saints that have walked before us in our lifetime, we see, Father, that they have walked with you no matter the circumstance. And this morning we pray and we ask, help us to walk that way with the full armor of God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.